Do you know what Islam says? It says that life's the greatest. Greetings, this is Dr. Lawrence Brown coming to you with another episode. We have been discussing the evidences for the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we left off discussing the example of his persistence and steadfastness in the face of adversity. And that is where I intend to continue this talk today. So perhaps the greatest example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his steadfastness against adversity was that during the time of persecution, when he was suffering the loss of his wealth, the loss of his social status, and humiliation, which for any Arab is worse than any wound, at this time the Quraysh came together and conveyed an offer to him to give up his preaching. The offer was as follows. Quote, if you, O Muhammad, are doing all this with a view to getting wealth, we will join together to give you greater riches than any Qureshite has possessed. If ambition moves you, we will make you our chief. If you desire kingship, we will readily offer you that. If you are under the power of an evil spirit which seems to haunt and dominate you so that you cannot shake off its yoke, then we shall call in skillful physicians to cure you. Now what have they just offered him? They have offered him the greatest wealth of any Qureshite. They have offered him the position of chief among them and the position of king, which are different positions, the chief being the one who actually orders affairs. Of course, Kingship in that time might have meant something different, but the fact of the matter was that in their minds there was a difference between the two, and they were both desirable. I mean, they were both as high as you can get, basically. And yet, what did Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? When the offer was conveyed to him through his uncle, Abu Talib, what did he say to his uncle? He said, quote, O oh my uncle, by Allah, if they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand on condition that I abandon this course until Allah makes me victorious or I perish therein, I would not abandon it. He is recognizing that he might perish upon this course. He is being offered the greatest riches and the greatest social position and the greatest power within his community and knowing that he might perish upon the path of bearing his message, he says that he would not take it, even if they offered him the sun in his right hand and the moon in his left. The example of a human being or the example of a prophet? Well, of course, he was both a human being and a prophet, but I think everybody gets the point. If we examine a man's claim to prophethood, we have to look at the other possibility, namely that he was not a prophet. But if not a prophet, what could Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam possibly have been doing this for? What could he possibly have hoped for? He has just been offered everything. Wealth, power, social status, to be chief, to be king, he has just been offered everything and he refuses it. Even though at this time he is being beaten, he is being humiliated, his life is threatened, he has fallen from wealth, he has fallen from social status, he is a social outcast, and yet he can rise from this low position that he has been beaten down into to the highest positions in the society in terms of wealth and power, and he refuses. Why? To bear his message. Is that not a powerful evidence for the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? At a time when anybody else would be conceiving a list of dreamed paybacks, he devotes himself to one thing, the conveyance of the message of prophethood. Similarly, 
when he did return to Mecca, victorious, establish the religion within Mecca, and establish himself as the prophet of Allah among the people, what did he do? He has returned to the city of his persecution. He has returned the victorious prophet at a time when any charlatan would be dreaming up, as I said before, a list of paybacks and start designing revelation to say, give the prophet this, give the prophet that. What did he do? He revealed revelation saying, quote, this day have I perfected your religion for you, completed my favor upon you, and have chosen for you Islam as your religion. This was a revelation signifying completion. We find another revelation at this time, quote, celebrate the praises of your Lord and pray for his forgiveness. Again, at a time when any charlatan would be tailoring revelation according to to their desires, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam revealed verses that signaled completion of the revelation, bade him and his followers to celebrate the praises of your Lord and pray for his forgiveness, and did not lower himself to his worldly desires. What was the final revelation in the Holy Quran during this time? The last verse revealed counseled Muhammad Quote, and fear the day when you shall be brought back to Allah. Then shall every soul be paid what it earned, and none shall be dealt with unjustly. From the Holy Quran 2, 281. Where other conquerors bask in self-veneration and die from the poisons of their excesses, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam transmitted a series of verses which bade him to glorify the Creator and seek his forgiveness. The exact opposite of what you expect from a charlatan, but precisely what you would expect from a prophet of Allah. He avoided the whim of self-glorification, the satiation of long, unsatisfied, suppressed lusts, and the satisfaction of a thirst for revenge, and instead devoted himself to the religion that he was committed to transmitting. In the words of Washington Irving, quote, even in his own dying hour, when there could be no longer a worldly motive for deceit, he, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, still breathed the same religious devotion and the same belief in his apostolic mission. With that, let's move on to the next evidence for the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that evidence is the category of lack of disqualifiers. We have discussed all of the things that point to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam having been a true prophet of Allah. Now let's discuss the sort of things that would have disqualified him from prophethood which we would expect to find in a human example, but significantly, which we do not find in the example of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To begin with, many false prophets claim divinity. They manipulate revelation for their own desires and for personal gain. They show signs of unreliability at some point. Maybe lying, maybe mental instability, or maybe we simply find out something about them at some point in their life which is not appropriate, not consonant with a man being a prophet. We do not find any of these in the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To begin with, some charge that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a voluptuary, that the purpose of his claim to prophethood was his love of women and that the revelation granted him the permission to have multiple wives. Well, it's a very vain argument. To begin with, if that were the case, never had a man in all the history of mankind suffered so greatly for something he could have had in any case. 
Before Islam, the Arabs lived in a period of jahiliya, identified by historians as the period of ignorance. They could have any number of wives, any number of concubines, any number of slave girls, any number of prostitutes. They could be free with their desires to a, an almost limitless capacity because this is what was socially accepted. And yet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married when he was 25, a chaste man up until that point, and remained married to Khadija, never betraying the lusts of ordinary men during the period of his youth when those lusts are most commonly expressed. And this was in a society where he could have expressed those lusts and not been thought less for them, but rather been thought more for them. Because the man who had many concubines, many slave girls, many prostitutes and so on was actually looked up to and not looked down upon. And yet he set the example of chastity both before marriage and during. With that thought, we're going to take a break. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Paradise. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown continuing this episode where we are discussing the evidences for the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I will continue where I left off. A lot of people reject the message of Islam because they don't like the message itself. It's not a matter of not liking the messenger, but not liking the message. One of the things that we find in the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the revelation that he revealed is that it is anything but a man's religion. Many object on the basis of saying, oh, this is a man's religion. You can marry as many as four wives. You can basically do the things that men like to do. This religion gives you that power. I'm really wondering, where have they studied Islam? Again, we are talking in this section on the lack of disqualifiers. Basically, the things that we would expect to find in a charlatan, but do not find in the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the society in which Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lived, gambling was rampant, drunkenness was a normal social activity, licentiousness was you know, looked up to rather than down upon, people feasted with abandon, um, laziness was a, an attribute of the higher class, etc. The qualities that people like are the same qualities that the revelation either forbade or curtailed. Gambling was forbidden. Alcohol became forbidden. Women could no longer be misused as they had been misused as prostitutes, but rather they had to be given their rights and respected in marriage. 1400 years before Western society recognized women's rights to property and inheritance to vote and to religion, Islam recognized women's right to those things. This was a huge social reform. If you think it's unpopular now, imagine how unpopular it was 1400 years ago. And yet this was the revelation that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam conveyed. He conveyed a revelation that curtailed or forbade the excesses and sins of his time and put mankind on a pathway of piety and respectability. Is this the example of a man who is driven by his desires when he is revealing a revelation that basically curtail or forbid what most men like to do? Or is this the example of a prophet bearing the message of Allah? To continue, I would like to analyze more of these objections, but the fact of the matter is that with pretty much every section that I have discussed, we simply don't have the time to go through it all, and so I have to recommend to the audience, if you would like to look into this deeper, please read my book. Godded for the book preceding it, Misguided. For this section, I am quoting from Godded, and both of these books can be found on my website, leveltruth.com, L-E-V-E-L-T-R-U-T-H.com. But unfortunately, given the constraints of time, I have to flip forward a little bit. As I mentioned earlier, one of the objections 
was that there is a passage in the Holy Quran, 48.2, which states that Allah forgave Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa for his sins. Some look at the statement and say, okay, well, so Muhammad had sins. Uh, well, so what? First of all, they were minor and they were extremely few, maybe in the category of misjudgments, but um, isn't this, again, the quality of a human being? Would a false prophet reveal a revelation that recognizes his sins? False prophets paint themselves as perfect. This revelation recognized that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had sins, and he was the one who conveyed the revelation. Do sins negate a person's prophethood? Of course not. But if we are going to say that sins negate a person's prophethood, we have to cast out Abraham and Ishmael, Isaiah, Noah, Moses. And obviously, we cannot do that. So the possibility, or the recognition, I should say, that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had sins is something you would expect of a prophet. Why? Because he's conveying a revelation, and he has to convey it as it is revealed. He might receive a verse like this that he would like to hide because it acknowledges his sins, but as a prophet, he is duty-bound to add it to the revelation. Another point is that in the Bible, we find Luke 15, 7 saying, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. In fact, this indicates that the person who repents creates more joy in heaven than the person who never went astray to begin with. We find that in the principles of the Jewish faith, that Moses was conceived the greatest of the prophets. In Christianity, Jesus Christ was elevated to the level of divinity. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could just as easily made such claims, and yet he consistently denied divinity and attributed it for himself, his humanity, and his prophethood. Instead, he transmitted a revelation that proclaimed as follows, we believe in Allah and the revelation given to us, and to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, and that given to Moses and Jesus, and that given to all prophets from their Lord, we make no difference between one and another of them, and we bow to Allah in Islam. So, if we are to pursue the consideration of this subject, we have to remember that Muhammad's example was one of temperance. He was not a voluptuary. He was not seeking the pleasure of women. Had he been so, number one, he could have had these things without the revelation because that was the social standard of his time. Number two, he was offered the wealth of the Quraysh, their kingship and their chieftainship. So he could have elevated himself to that position simply by receiving their offer. However, he denied it for the sake of transmitting his message of revelation. Yes, he had multiple marriages. Are they an example of licentiousness? No. Let us remember that he married for practical reasons. Through his marriages, he cemented intertribal ties, he sheltered orphaned widows and divorcees, and he demonstrated Islamic marital limits. He did not do what you would expect a leader to do. He did not handpick the choicest maidens of the realm and assemble a harem of the most beautiful uh, women of his time. No, only one of his wives, Aisha, was a virgin. The remainder were either divorced or older or a combination thereof. Maimuna was 51 years old when he married her, but she was young enough to be Umm Salama's child because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married Umm Salama, Zainab was divorced from a freed slave, which was a social stigma that was almost unthinkable of at the time, and yet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married her. In a time when other leaders were setting up rules such as the right of the Lord, the droit de seigneur, which allowed the lord of a feudal realm to bed 
the wives of his vassals on their wedding night at a time when people were running amok in licentiousness, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did the exact opposite. He exemplified temperance. Yes, he had multiple wives, but for practical reasons. Is that in the Bible we find he had fewer wives than Solomon, less transgression than David, who was recorded as having arranged the death of Bathsheba's husband out of lust for Bathsheba. More restraint than Judah, who is recorded as having had an incestuous affair with Tamar. Why? Because he thought she was a prostitute, which in and of itself would have been bad enough. Better than all of these examples is the example of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not to speak poorly of Solomon or David or Judah, but rather to suggest that if you take those examples as the examples of prophets or patriarchs, you have to recognize the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to have been superior to the example of the polygamy of Solomon, the licentiousness or the licentious story, whether true or not, of David and that of Judah, who, according to the story, was willing to contract prostitute. So I will conclude by saying that yes, Islam permits polygamy within limits as polygamy was permitted in the Old Testament. And we know that although it was not expressly permitted in the New Testament, most certainly it was not forbidden. With that, I will conclude this episode. I thank you for being with me and We'll look forward to next time. Peace. I feel the peace. I feel the peace.